to say that that there is an objective point of view is naive. And and so let's let's make sure we look at everyone's beginning assumptions or starting point of view and then evaluate the evidence accordingly. Hey guys, welcome back to Saints Unscripted. It's me, Jackson. I'm here with David and our good friend, Dr. Kerry Mielstein. And he's got this book. Let's talk about the book of Abraham. And we are so excited to have you here on the show. Wait, wait, wait. Before we get into this, we got to hype Kerry up more. Okay. We, I, this yeah. guy is a living legend. Just this morning, I watched your segment on National Geographic's Lost Treasures of Egypt. This guy... I, we have a list of your qualifications here. Vice President for, from the, the Society for the Study of Egyptian Antiquities, BYU Egypt Excavation Project Director, <laughs> essentially Indiana Jones is what we're talking about here. <laughs> yeah. Well, people things. think Harrison Ford and I look exactly like that, so yeah, yeah, I can see that. Anyways, we're excited to have you here. All right, so uh, let's talk about the Book of Abraham. This is from Deseret Book. But what we've done is we've put together a few questions that we have for you. So first question, what are some of the most common and in your mind most problematic assumptions that some Latter-day Saints or maybe non-Latter-day Saints are making or have made historically about the history of the Book of Abraham? And could you also give us a bit of framework of how to correct some of those assumptions that people have made? But there are two key assumptions that people often make. One is that people tend to assume they know what Joseph Smith was translating from. And usually the assumption is we have some papyri fragments, mm-hmm. and on one of them is a drawing, we call it a vignette, Egyptologically, um, that the facsimile one is a facsimile of this drawing, right? Mm-hmm. And so people naturally assume, oh, that's and I can understand that assumption, that Joseph was translating from the text around there. But there are a number of ways, and I go into it in depth in there, there are a number of ways of testing that assumption. It turns out to be a problematic assumption and and like 99% falsifiable, I would say. Mm-hmm. Like there's some chance that maybe all of these things that, that look like they point towards this conclusion are wrong. But all the evidence we have points towards the conclusion that that's not what he's translating from. And the second one? The second one is about the facsimiles. Basically... Uh, they'll say, well, Joseph Smith says that these facsimiles mean this, and Egyptologists say that it means this. So why is there a difference? All right, so I'd say, first of all, we're assuming that we know that Joseph Smith is telling us what ancient Egyptians would have said about this, uh, and then that Egyptologists can tell us accurately what ancient Egyptians from that time period would have said about this, and it's a time period where we actually don't know very much, and we've actually been able to look and see on, like, for example, the kind of drawing that facsimile 2 is, When we see what Egyptologists have been saying that these characters represented for a long time, and then we actually found some examples, John Gee found some examples where the Egyptians were telling us what they meant, and the Egyptologists were wrong in most cases, right? So, and by say the Egyptologists, I mean myself as well. Uh, I'd say it's also a false assumption that what Joseph Smith says doesn't match up with what Egyptologists say. In a number of cases, it matches up pretty well. Yeah, really, really well, like enough where you have to start to, to. just believe that uh, coincidence is the guiding uh, idea of the universe uh, or something like that if you're going to try and explain this away, right? So, And, uh, and as kind of an example of that, like, I put myself in Joseph Smith's shoes, right? And I think, okay, if I'm a fraud and I'm looking at these facsimiles, like, okay, here's this alligator figure here. What does that translate to in English? And he comes up, what he comes up with, which uh, is... Uh, a god, correct? Well, I think he associates it, uh, now we'll have to double check, but uh, with Pharaoh, but it ends up being a god that is associated with Pharaoh at the time period of Abraham. Yeah, and so it's like, how does he cut, like, it's an alligator, how do you come up with this and be correct? So there's something going on there. Yeah, right. Or you've got four tall standing figures, why would you say, oh, I, I know, those are the four cardinal directions. Right? Yeah. But that's what he says, and actually they do represent that yeah. Egyptologically. Right? So, yeah, that's, that's pretty good faking it. Second question. You reiterate over and over again in the book that revelation is not only one of many sources of, of knowing truth, uh, but that it is, in fact, the most reliable source of knowing. Mm-hmm. It seems fairly common, though, that a Latter-day Saint will be chatting with a Protestant or a Catholic friend, And it turns out that each person feels sincerely led by God, but in opposite directions. So how would you approach a a fairly common scenario like this? What tips can you give us to help us learn to recognize and be confident in revelation when it comes? 
there are all sorts of things that we need to pursue the academic method or something along those lines. But the most important questions, really, so for example, is Jesus Christ the Son of God and does he live again? Uh, I think that's only going to be answered by revelation. I don't think the academic process is equipped to give us the answer to that question. Now, it gets a little more tricky, as you said, where, what if, and I, I do have good uh, Protestant friends who have had, uh, not had revelation that the book of Abraham is true, but have had revelation that they should be following the path that they're following and, and believing in, in uh, Christ uh, the way they are and worshiping with the pastor they are and so on. Then what we can do is we can invite people and say, and this is kind of a little bit of what that last chapter is about, where I'll say, read the text of the book of Abraham. Just read it and pray. And if God reveals to you that this is truth, then accept it. Um, and if he doesn't, I'm not going to ask you to, to alter your life's pattern because God hasn't revealed it to you, right? But I will ask that don't start persecuting me or, or trying to convince me or my family or my friends that our revelation is invalid. Well, let's go on to the next question. Yeah. So this is a, probably a more sensitive, controversial question. Um, many of your online critics claim that because you feel that Joseph Smith is a prophet, that's your belief, that you have closed yourself off to the possibility the Book of Abraham is all false or completely fraudulent. The general claim is that this is an academically unsound approach and that your scholarship is it's suspect because you're unwilling to consider any other conclusion that challenges your worldview and your beliefs. What are your thoughts on that? So let's let's think of it this way. First of all, I believe that there are no researchers who don't come in with a certain set of assumptions or ways of operating. It is a faith-based choice, one way or the other. You cannot prove that revelation exists. You can't disprove that it exists. All right, so what I'm doing is being intellectually honest and asking for those who disagree with me to also be intellectually honest and say, here are the beginning assumptions I have. And so often instead, they just say, no, look, he's got that beginning assumption, so he's wrong and it's bad research, when as they're doing that, actually they are being intellectually yeah. dishonest and not admitting what their own assumptions, are, their own interpretive lenses are. And I find it really ironic, those who, uh, when I've said, let's be honest about this, here's where I start, who then say, oh, look how this is a problem for them, while they pretend that their starting place isn't problematic. I just... I, th I think that's not a healthy conversation either. I think that's very interesting that usually when, when people think the, the idea of objectivity is like, okay, I have no biases. Yeah. But as you're saying, that it, one, it's impossible. And two, it's it's not only dishonest, but it, it you'll never get to objectivity. It's interesting that to get to objectivity, let's admit our biases. Let's admit right. our subjectivity. I think that sometimes these kind of claims... These, these happen, it, people throw these around all the time at, at different scholars and different people saying, oh, they have this preconceived notion, therefore you can ignore everything they say. And it's kind of playing on people's confirmation bias yeah. by giving them an easy out yeah. and saying, you don't need to pay attention to anything they're saying. Um, but kind of what I hear you saying is, no, 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 like they're right. I do come from this certain perspective but look at look at the research and uh, you know find fault with it if yeah. if there is fault with it. Good. But come to your own conclusions about it. Good. And also look at the perspective that someone who's writing from a different point of view is coming from. Don't don't uh, let them get away with pretending like they're objective. Right. To to say that that there is an objective point of view is naive. Hmm. That's all it is. It's just naivete. And and so let's let's make sure we look at everyone's beginning assumptions or starting point of view, and then evaluate the evidence accordingly. That's all I'm asking for. All right. One more question. We address a lot of different difficult topics on this channel, as I think you've seen before. Um, but the Book of Abraham is by far one of the most controversial topics people are talking about. What general advice uh, would you want people to know who might be struggling with this topic? That is such a great question, and, and I'm glad you asked that. I think it's important that we uh, recognize that questions... And exploring those questions and trying to struggle to find how you feel about those questions, that's a natural process. We should all be going through that process. And so I would say pursue trying to find answers wholeheartedly and full throttle, just all the way you can. But as you do that, really do it full throttle and wholeheartedly. Don't say, I'm going to look at these kinds of sources and not these kinds of sources. If you want answers, look at everything. And, and be open to everything and recognize everyone's starting assumptions. I would then plead 
And this is whether it's the Book of Abraham or the Book of Mormon or whatever, plead with you to continue then to read. If you have questions about the Book of Abraham, read the Book of Abraham. Keep searching that which claims to be Scripture, because that's actually your best opportunity to find out if it is Scripture. Let's talk about the Book of Abraham. You can find it at uh, Deseret Book or, or uh, well, probably just Deseret Book, I think. Uh, Seagull Book. Or <laughs> Seagull Book. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the Book of Abraham. Sold wherever Let's Talk About the Book of Abraham is sold. Yeah. Just look it up online. If people have questions for you, where can they go? Um, probably going to, to BYU's website and you can search for me and there's a way you can send me information. Okay. Uh, there's also bookofabraham.org is, is a good source and, uh, Pearl of Great Price Central.org. Most of those other sources, you can contact me in one way or another on those. Sounds great. Everyone, thank you so much for watching today. Carrie, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. You guys have a great day.